Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Inside the Wrongful Conviction of Daniel Holtzclaw, episode 14. Um, Kay did an excellent job last week uh, making that opening, and I just thought, you know what, I never do that, so <laughs> I appreciate that, and uh, it was definitely helpful. So, uh, uh, I don't want to waste too much time um, chit-chatting necessarily. Um, I'm hoping that everyone here is doing well on the panel. Um, okay, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't really have anything new to share, so. Okay. All right, Cherie, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Inside the Wrongful Conviction of Daniel Holtzclaw. Yes, very much so. And Jack, how are we doing? I'm doing just fantastic. Just Jim Dandy. Hello, everyone. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> when you, that just sounds, okay, never mind. Uh, Susan, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, Rhonda. I'm glad you're feeling better, too. Hello, oh, everyone. You. I appreciate that. Yes, I have my mostly my normal voice back now or sound. Um, healing fairly well, uh, but still having discomfort enough that I might end up having to take a pain pill once a night at night. But other than that, I'm doing much better, I think. So um, I just want to say really quickly, I know that foul play is, I, I got thinking, Jack, when I saw that you were going live, you know, you're going to stream for us. I know that everybody over in foul play is hoping for an open mic tonight. And um, so for those of you who might have been misled by Jack's um, stream right now, thinking that it was going to be um, open mic, it's not, I'm really sorry. Um, but you know, that's another topic for another time, um, whenever, when and if Jack decides that they're going to do that. Um, so we will read tonight. Uh, after our last week, I read through um, transcripts of uh, Sherry Ellis's boyfriend, Edwin Smith, and um, her common law husband at the time. Terry Mack and you know her case is just so big and so I, I don't know if important is the right word I can't think of a word but more significant perhaps than some of the other cases I thought you know those were the only two witnesses so I just thought you know we're just going to go ahead and read those and they're not very long so that's what we're going to do tonight and um we have my same amazing readers who are going to help us uh, read and where is the, oh, there it is. Um, okay. Um, so we're going to start with Edwin Smith's uh, witness testimony, and um, his testimony was given on November twenty third, two thousand fifteen. So um, Kay is going to read uh, the testimony of um, Edwin Smith, and Susan's going to read uh, the part for whew, Prosecutor Gigger, and then a Jack will read for Scott Adams, and Cherie's going to cover the court for us. So whenever you folks are ready to go, we can start. Can Mr. Start Smith, there you go. Uh, do you know a lady by the name of Sherry Ellis? Yes, I do, sir. How long have you known Ms. Ellis, sir? About two and a half years now. About two and a half years? Somewhere along in there. Can you describe to the jury what your relationship is with Ms. Ellis, please? Well, right now, at this time, she's my fiance. All right. And the relationship that has obviously developed into fiance... Uh, you said you've known her for two and a half, three years. Is that right? Approximately about two and a half years. 
has it been a romantic relationship the entire time or did that change over the course of time? Basically, we were intimate. You know, we met and we started messing around. That happened pretty quick? Not really quick. Maybe a month or so in our relationship. Somebody opened the door back there. I, I didn't understand what you said. About a month or two after we met, about a month or two after that, we started getting into it. Thank you, sir. Jeez. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, were you aware at the time that you began to have a relationship? If she, did you know if she was involved with someone else? Yes, I did. Had she told you about that? Yes, she did. Nevertheless, a, a relationship developed. Is is that fair to say? Yes, sir. All right, sir. Were there times during the either spring or early summer of 2014 that she would come and see you in regards to that relationship? Yes, sir. In relation to where you lived and where she lived, is it close enough to walk? Yes, sir. Is that on the northeast side of the town? Yes, it is. Sir, whenever she would come see you during that time period, Again, into the spring and early summer of 2014, had your relationship developed to where it was intimate and it was a sexual relationship? Yes, sir. Okay. You remember at some point during the summer of 2014, her coming to you and talking to you about an event that had occurred that upset her? Yes, she did. And can you describe for me the demeanor? That she was demonstrating whenever she told you about that, sir? Judge, may I approach? Come on. Judge, I object to this witness testifying. Again, it's all hearsay. Anything he would have to say is hearsay. Secondly, it's all just bolstering. It's all they're doing is trying to bolster the victim's testimony. Because no matter what happens, this is after the event allegedly occurred. But it's at least one month, if not more, after the event occurred. And I object to any testimony as not being relative. That the probative value is outweighed by, the, by its prejudicial effect. That it's improper bolstering and there's really no relevance to it in the trial here today. It's nearly impossible to cross-examine people when all you have to go off of uh, is something that they were allegedly told by the victim months after the alleged event happened. Because, I mean, they're not on trial here. They're just sitting here trying to help improperly bolster. And all the other objections I had earlier about what this what this said. So I object to this, to, uh, to his, any of his testimony. Your Honor. It's not improper bolstering to ask a witness whenever they became aware of an event that was upsetting to another witness, especially in a case where continually the assertion is that the, the defenses, I'm sorry, that the state's detectives have contacted these ladies, put the idea in their head by talking about that they had received a tip that they had been sexually harassed and then making reference after reference to every witness as to when they went on the internet and found stuff out about this case and when they watched the news. That's the relevance of it. It's what he's going to say is that he, she discussed this issue with him before the police got involved, before they knew anything on the TV about it. Well, this is the thing. The question that's on the floor right now is basically. What was her demeanor whenever she talked to him? Was there, what was her demeanor when she was talking? Was there, what was her demeanor when there was an event that when she was talking to you about an event? So I don't know what year, where we're at or anything such as that. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought I laid the foundation that we were in the summer of 2014. 
All I can, uh, and I can do it again, but I thought I'd done that. Well, you asked if they were in a relationship in the summer of 2014. Okay. But I understand what your objection is, but we haven't even gotten there yet as to, I mean, I think you're anticipating what may be coming, but so you can make your objections at the time that they come in. I did. I'm just wanting to state for the record my objection to this witness even testifying because he has, from everything I've been provided, he has no knowledge of the events that she just testified to and has not even told uh, not even told about it under the uh, lot, lot most favorable uh, to the state until over a month later. Well, and see, right now I don't know any of that. Okay. Mr. Smith, uh, the event that you told me about something that had upset her, do you recall when that conversation was that she told you about that? Yes, sir. When was she telling you? Uh, don't you, don't tell me what she said, but tell me when you had the conversation with her. Summer of last year. The summer of 14? Yes, sir. Okay. And when she, when was she describing an event that had happened recently or an event that had happened sometime before that, if you know? She told me it had, that it had happened prior to when she told me. Okay. Do you have any idea as to how long or did you take anything from the conversation as to how, how much before days, weeks, months, do you know? About a month later. Okay. That was your understanding? Yes, sir. And even though it was a month later, I had asked you about her demeanor during this conversation. Can you describe what her demeanor was to you? Do you know what I mean when I say demeanor? Like she was like shook up and she didn't really want to tell me because she said I would end up leaving her. And I ask her, what was wrong with her? Judge, I would object to. Sustained. I know sometimes it's hard to do it. I don't want you to tell me what she said yet. I just want you to tell me the way she was acting, okay? Well, she was like real, you know, shaky, nervous. Was she emotional? Yes, sir. Could you tell what she was emotional about? In other words, was she emotional about something else that had happened or was she emotional about what she was telling you about? She was emotional about what she was telling me, what, what she was telling me that happened to her. And did she give you information relevant to those events and what she said to help you understand why she was acting this way? Yes, sir. Before you answer, let the judge make a ruling, but I want to ask you what she told you. Judge, the previous objection I just made at the bench. All right, sustained. Can I approach and make a record? Yes. Judge, my response is, I think I've laid a foundation for an excited utterance. She's relaying a startling and upsetting event. She is under the distress and the emotion as she recalls those events. Her testimony is specifically on point to what it was that, I'm sorry, her statements were on point as to what it was that caused her to be upset. There is no time requirement for excited utterance. There is one for present sense impression, but for excited utterance, I don't believe there's a time requirement. And with those foundations, I think that he's entitled, not for the truth of the matter asserted, <coughs> excuse me, but what is being offered as an exception under the hearsay rule in that it shows her demeanor. Well, and quite frankly, I don't want to misstate. For the purposes of what I believe I've done with my foundation is that I do think it comes in as an exception to the hearsay rule. I don't believe. <laughs> God damn it, man. He is yeah. a trip. 
excited yeah. utterance. I mean, to I me, think I, I can do whatever I want, Judge. Don't you agree? Right. Can I just there's do no, whatever I want? I'm going to tell you a bunch of shit here, and uh, there's I no time that. limit on. There's no time limit on how long I have to bring this up. <laughs> right. Um, okay. I don't believe it even comes close to an exception to the excited utterance, Your Honor. I previously made a pretty lengthy record in regards to all of my objections, and that that is probative, and that its probative value certainly outweighed by its prejudicial effect. It's here. It's clear hearsay. Secondly, it was not spontaneous in any sense of the form or fashion. Under his reading of the excited utterance, literally, anytime anything, someone, or some uh, what traumatic has allegedly happened to me, I can just relive it to a third party and then it would be admissible in court. And I object to it because that's not what the excited utterance is about. And I object to and I object on all the other grounds I've previously stated when I objected to his testimony at all. All right. Objection sustained. Mr. Smith, whenever she related what it was that had upset her, did it upset you? Yes, it did. But like I said at first, I didn't really believe her. What she told me was what's going on with her. Again, sir, you, you need to be careful how you answer. I don't want you to tell me what she said, but you can tell me why it is that you didn't believe her at first. I wouldn't ever think that a police officer would rape her. Judge, I would object. All right, sustained. Asked to approach. Sustained. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Again, I don't want you to give me details about what she told you, but what was it, just in general, about what she said that seemed unbelievable to you? That she just walked from my house. Okay. And back to her boyfriend's house at the time, and... Then she was going to her cousin's house. Okay, hang on, hang on. Try it this way. <laughs> Let me testify for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At first, what she told you had happened. Did it seem like something that you thought would happen in our society? No, sir. Judge, I would object to the form. All right, overruled. He's answered. Is that why you didn't believe her? Yes, sir. Later, did you come to believe her? Well, yes, I did. Judge, object. Relevance. Sustained. In the time period before she shared this information with you, and the time period after she shared this information with you, did you notice a change in her behavior? Yes, I did. Judge, object to the relevance. Overruled. You can answer that. Huh. How did she change, sir? She was always crying. She was very emotional. Just like she was always stressed out. Did you attribute that to the event that she had shared with you? Yes, I did, sir. To this day, you still notice those type of things in her behavior? Yes, sir. Pass the witness. Okay, I will. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, oh, oh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's about four minutes to five, so we'll go ahead and break before we start cross-examination tomorrow morning. Is there? Do you want me to continue? No, you don't have to continue. Okay. Um, Is there so cross? I don't think there was cross, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't know... Okay, full, full transparency. It was high. <laughs> oh, hang on. You're not, you're, you're not saying you were drugged up or anything. Or anything. <laughs> hang on a minute. Let me look. Okay, I was going to say I can, but yeah, if you. <laughs> but, <laughs> hey, I mean, while I'm doing that, so 
the testimony is that she didn't know Edwin at the time this happened to her. No, That's she right. did. They were dating. What's Wait, the what? after the event? I'm sorry, I'm confused with the testimony. I should have stopped yeah, you me, way back there. Me too. I was I was under my impression that they didn't know each other. That's how I read the testimony. Doesn't um, she say or Sherry say at one point that she had two DNA two DNAs in her or something like that? Two that DNAs. Flight? Remember that? Uh, that? Yeah, that's what her common law husband Terry Mack said she shouldn't bother going to the to get a test because she had two DNAs in her. Right. From her yeah. Well, yeah. Um he said he said she was walking from his house back to her boyfriend's yes. and then to her cousins. Yes. Yeah, which I, I caught that in when I was reading through it. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> But she, yeah, but she waited a month to tell. But, but, but she waited yeah. a month to tell him about what happened. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, that yeah. that doesn't. Okay. Okay. Got gotcha. you. Huh. Um. So when? What was the? What was the? Uh, alleged date of the? Um, of the May assault. 7th. So May June seventh. May. Yeah. Right, but I'm just thinking. Oh, uh, oh, May 7th. To Janie, to, yeah. Janie Liggins. Yeah. Uh, but wait, when did she come forward, though, even? Well, she talked to Kim Davis, talked to her on, I think it was August 5th. August. On the phone. But, yeah. Yeah, there's no cross. Yeah, I didn't think Weird. there was. I mean, um, what would you. Well, yeah, what can you really. Yeah. I mean, except for just to call him a liar, really. I mean, not sure. Come that on, man. That well. whole excited utterance thing is such bullshit. Oh, I man. Mean, that's the ridiculous. Whole... Okay, so here's what makes it bullshit. Let me find this where that was. Yeah. Oh, here's why it's not an excited utterance. She apparently, I mean, it, according to this story where he says that she said I, she didn't want to tell me because I would end up leaving her. That yeah. means, that means according to this version of events that she thought about it. That's not an excited utterance, and that's exactly what Scott Adams could have crossed on. But right. I think it really is. Well, I shouldn't say anything's irrelevant because he got sixty-two years for her oh, count. Right. So exactly. Yeah. 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 So. Oh, good. So I wasn't so high that I didn't get all the proper testimony um and if i had just looked i could have just looked and told you the page numbers would have told me that too but anyway um so yeah i just i don't know when i first read the part where he said something about um she was walking from my house and then and then i was like you know i got stuck i was like oh my gosh because that's not her testimony or that's not her accusation. And then he said back to her boyfriend's house and then to her cousins. Even when I read that, I was like, well, that sounded a little coached, <laughs> you know, or that sounded like a little, I don't know. I just sounded made up to me or like information had been offered anyway. So, uh, so that was Edwin Smith's, her boyfriend's. Uh, testimony. I think they're actually married now, but at the, by the time of trial, they, they were engaged, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they're still okay. married. Yeah. And good for her. I mean, you know, hell, Jesus, whatever. But you know what? I feel very much, and not any of you who have seen the uh, the uh, test of uh, the deposition video clip, she feels, I think she feels guilty 
that she knows that she wrongfully that she wrong she accused someone who wasn't guilty of anything i think she feels guilt over that but i don't think she feels enough guilt that she's you know trying to clear her conscience and come forward and say no he's not the one I, you know if she that's yeah, where well, she needs to be now all she has to say is i mean if she if she was raped by a police officer she never was given the opportunity to give her version of events before kim told her what happened yeah i have no idea what huh. we know who did more, this to you yeah where do you go from there right i'm having issues here i'm going to stop sharing my screen <laughs> i don't know how that happened yeah kim davis you know well just like with all of them did i show what is happening um maybe we could look over terry max police report and edwin smith's police report if they yeah. exist i can't remember um i can't i'm i, I don't feel like, remember yeah i, I feel like edwin sure. has i think they do i can i think i looked them up late, or i looked them up recently but i can look again okay we should read through those after this. Yeah, for sure. Okay, now I think I have it. Oh, Lord. Okay. Okay, there we go. I got it right now. I need to figure out how to do this. Uh, I know that I can fix this so that I can have all of us in one section and also make the fill the screen more with the trial testimony i'll have to play with that later but anyway okay so sheree's looking for that we'll go over those after a while um but we can go ahead and start on um very mac yeah we can just start with a direct examination by miss mcconnell of terry mac Mr. Mack, do you know a person by the name of Sherry Ellis? Yes. And how do you know Ms. Ellis? We were together for about 19 years. Okay. Were you, and when you say together, were you in a dating relationship? Yes. And did you reside together for a certain period of time? Yes, we did. And whenever you were living with Sherry Ellis... Were you living with her during May, in the summer of 2014? Yes, I was. Okay. May? And sometime... wait, 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 wait. Wait, what was that? Oh, May, I, I forgot. We May when the yeah. alleged assault occurred. I was thinking me. we were still on Edwin Smith. Good God. Oh, yeah. Okay, Hopefully. sorry about that. Carry on. Okay, and sometime during May of 2014, did Sherry Ellis tell you something that was unusual that had happened to her? Yes, she did. What was her demeanor whenever she told you this thing? She was a little distraught. And do you want me to tell you what she told me? No, I just want you to tell me for now how she was acting whenever she told you this. Well, she was just distraught, like scared, like, what's wrong and then you know she told me what had happened when you said that she was distraught was she crying well, somewhat yeah was this a type of distraught way that was this the type of distraught way that she was acting was this something that she had acted like before was this something you saw no, no. God. Jeez. Can she Did she speak? describe? Yeah. Did she describe something that had happened to her? Yes, she did. Okay. And this thing that she described that had happened to her, 
Was that what was making her upset and distraught? Yes. And specifically, what did she tell you, sir? Your Honor, I object. May we approach? Come on up. Your Honor, I object. I object on hearsay and also improper bolstering. Additionally, I have Mr. Mack's interview by her Oklahoma City, oh. by the Oklahoma City Police Department. He never says anything about her being distraught or somewhat crying. Says anything about her being uh, so, okay or in any way, shape or form. Uh, I have been on notice that she, that he's going to testify to her demeanor. And he already said, has. No, they're, they're getting ready to try and elicit a hearsay statement from him about what the, the witness has already testified to. And I object to it as being cumulative, being bolstering, also being hearsay, Your Honor. Your Honor, with regard to the hearsay objection, it qualifies as an excited <laughs> utterance. My ah! God. Uh, oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> He was excited. She was ex <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. Miss Ellis already testified that whenever this, whenever the event happened to her that she described in front of the jury with Officer Holtzclaw, is she came home and told Terry Mack immediately what had happened. Mr. Mack has also testified that she came in and told him something around May 2014 and how she was acting whenever she said that. It comes in as an excited utterance because it describes an event that she was upset about that had happened, according to Sherry Ellis's testimony, mere minutes before. Sorry. Um... Okay, well, this witness hasn't said it either, May or summer of 2014, so I'm going to sustain the objection. And, Judge, if I may, I realized after Mr. Adams had objected that I had yet to ask him specifically, although Ms. Ellis has testified to the timing of it, but after I ask him about the timing, I'm going to, my offer of proof is that he will say that she described something to him that had occurred to her minutes before. And then I'm going to ask again the question about what did she tell him? So should I approach before then? Well, I guess we'll see if the foundation is laid. So as to approach before, okay? What? Mr. Well, Mack. Hey, hey. Before, before we start back, just one brief comment. So, Sherry Ellis telling uh, Terry Mack right after it happened is an excited utterance. Sherry Ellis telling, uh, 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 what was his name, Edwin? Mm-hmm. Yes. The yeah. Daily guy. A month yeah. later, it's a, it's an excited utterance. It can't be both. It can't be. It can't. So, anyway. I agree. Mr. Mack, the thing that you told me about that Ms. Ellis had described to you that had occurred with her, do you remember telling me that? Yes. Okay. Was it something that had happened to Ms. Ellis the same day as she told you? Yes. Had it happened just minutes before she came home and told you? Yes. And what specifically did Ms. Ellis tell you? Same objections as I previously stated, Your Honor. Come up here just a minute. This is the thing. I think you're like you've laid a foundation for excited, <clears throat> excuse me, utterance. But what we got to make sure is the witness is an excited utterance. An excited utterance to be admissible has to be specifically what someone said, not a paraphrase, not a roundabout, or those kinds of things. Sure. I think the foundation is laid if this was minutes after this happened. It was made while she was under the stress of the event. So I'll allow it, but it's got to be specific. If he starts saying something else, then Mr. A Mr. Adams, you feel free to object and see where it goes. Exactly. That's exactly what I was saying. It, it can't be right after an event. 
and then a month later, yeah. like Giger tried to pull. I mean, you can just yeah. God, God, I'll shut so up. Slimy. I'm <laughs> telling you. Yeah, he's slimy. And Mr. Mac, I want you to tell me what Ms. Ellis told you, but I want you to use her words specifically, not paraphrasing. Do you understand? Well, she came in the house and she was acting all funny and she was like tearful like and I asked her, what's the matter? Did you say she was tearful like? Yeah. Okay. What did she say? Well, I asked her, I said, what is the matter? And she said, a policeman, I just got raped by a policeman. And I just said, what? She said, a policeman raped me. I said, then I said, okay, well, let's go to the hospital and get a DNA test. Because if he raped you, I said, the policeman's DNA is on file. So they don't, so they don't contaminate a crime scene. Uh, they know the difference between their DNA and a perpetrator's. Oh, wow. A perp. A, he says perpetrator. Okay. Right. <laughs> How did Ms. Ellis respond to that? Well, that's when she really like started crying and breaking down. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, I said, well, how many man's sperm is going to be in you? And she told me two. And I said, we can still go get a DNA. She said, all right, well, all right counsel, come up. I don't know if you were going to object to this, but what he's talking about, going to the hospital and all that kind of stuff, is not an excited utterance about the event. Just so that the record was clear, I'd, I'd objected to any hearsay statements as improper bolstering and being cumulative and it being hearsay and, and not admissible. I objected, I objected to all of it. And I just figured that the court would, had overruled me and told her they'd laid a, found, a proper foundation. Well, as far as an excited utterance, but discussing going to the hospital. Uh, I, I disagree. And I'll move on, Your Honor. I'm sure. You already yeah, got it in. Can I, can, can, yeah, can, can't unring the bell now. So, did Miss Ellis go to the hospital that day, Mr. Mack? No, she didn't. Did you or she report to police what had happened that day? No. She said she was afraid of what... Without telling me what she said, Mr. Mack, did you report to police? No, we didn't. After that happened, did you continue to live with Miss Ellis for a while? Yes, we did. Did you notice any changes in her behavior and demeanor? Yes. Can you tell me about those? Judge, again, I would object under the previously provided discovery, as I discussed earlier. All right, overruled. You can answer, Mr. Mack. I, she was reluctant to go outside. She was withdrawn. She just wasn't herself. May I have a brief moment, Your Honor? Yes. Mr. Mack, those behavior changes that you just described to me, how long did you observe those in Ms. Ellis? About like two weeks or so, I think. I'll pass the witness, Judge. All right. Any cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Mack, it's my understanding that back in 2014, your living girlfriend was Ms. Ellis. Yes. You would agree with me that at, at that point in time, Ms. Ellis was a convicted felon, correct? Yes. You also have some prior felony convictions, correct? Could I ask a question? Well, you can answer the question. 
Yeah, I was a convicted felon, but I didn't rape no women. No, you, you actually sold drugs here in Oklahoma City area. No, I didn't. So whenever you pled guilty, you were com you were convicted of... I have never pled guilty for selling drugs. Hang on a second, Mr. Matt. Okay, well, don't let him say things. Hang on, hang on. That I didn't do. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Listen to me. I'm the one that gives the orders around here. Okay, oh. thank you. Not you, not him, not anybody but me. Okay, well, don't accuse me of something I didn't do. Listen, answer the question as best you can. Let him ask a question, then you can answer it. If the DA thinks something needs to be cleared up, they'll have an opportunity. The way this system works is a person gets to ask questions, the witness answered. The DA gets to clear things, clear up anything that it, they want to clear up. So you need to just listen to the questions and answer best you can. Mr. Mack, I, I want to be there with you then. You said that you were a convicted felon. Tell the jury what you're convict, a convicted felon of. Possession of a straight shooter. What is, what is a straight shooter? A pipe that you use to smoke crack. Or well, use... What? Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. That's not a you don't get a felony for being in possession of, of a crack drug pipe. paraphernalia. <laughs> you <laughs> don't. No. Come on. <laughs> Liar. Okay, sorry. That's all right. And... And are you saying that's all that you're a convicted felon of? Yes. You also understand that being a convicted felon, you're not allowed to have a firearm, correct? Yes. Are you a convicted felon for having a firearm? For pawning a firearm. Okay. So you were in possession of a firearm while you were... If you'll let me finish my question, sir, I'll let you finish your answer. Are you a convicted felon? As a convicted felon, did you own, use, or possess a firearm? No. So you deny that charge? Yes. Okay. May I have just one moment, Your Honor? Yes. Do you recall being here in Oklahoma County and pleading guilty to possession of a controlled dangerous substance and possession of a firearm? No. Okay. Do you recall at any time being sentenced to five years in the penitentiary for that? Uh, that's what I was sentenced to five years in the penitentiary for probation violation. From my understanding, I didn't know nothing about a firearm. Probation violation of what felony? <laughs> God. <Yeah. laughs> Jesus. Uh, okay. So if uh, if your felony convictions show that you were carrying a firearm at the time you were committing a felony, you would deny that fact, correct? I sure would. I sure would. Do you recall being convicted in three separate felony cases? And I'll be happy to give you the felony case numbers if you want me to read them off to you. Read them off. Okay. CF-97-06767 here in Oklahoma County. Case. Sorry, counsel. Hold on. Uh, CF 97. Let me just start over. CF 97. CF 97 06767 here in Oklahoma County. CF 99 01242 here in Oklahoma County. CF 99 03057. Would you agree with me that those are three separate felony cases here in Oklahoma County that either you were convicted of or pled guilty to? I don't even know what they are. Okay. Well, do you recall ever being charged or being convicted of obstructing a criminal matter, an investigation? No, I do not. You recall being, I think you testified earlier, you were convicted of a straight shooter. And you believe that that was a crackpot, correct? Yeah. 
So you do recall that one? Yeah, I recall that. That's what I was sentenced for. <laughs> you recall? <laughs> you recall being convicted of another drug crime after that one? Yes, I was convicted of a drug crime. After the crack, after the straight shooter. Yes, because the policeman said, you have a drug case and you're going to have another one. So was it, again, was it the police were just lying? Who was lying? The police. Are you suggesting this jury that the police were lying on your second conviction? I sure am. Okay. And then, in addition to that, they were lying when they said that you had a firearm during the commission of a felony offense here in Oklahoma City area. I was in a pawn shop. A guy was standing there, and I said, I don't have my ID. Sir, I'm not asking you. Would you pawn this for me? Your Honor, I would ask that the witness be instructed to answer. All right. No. Listen to listen the to question. Oh, listen to no, the I'll... question and just answer it the best you can. What did you intend on doing with the firearm here in Oklahoma City community when you were a convicted felon? I didn't have objection to relevance. The firearm. Hang on, hang on, hang on. In the Oklahoma City community. Sir. I had a firearm. Listen to me, sir. In the in a pawn shop. Sir, you're going to have to follow my instructions, my orders. Okay. If you don't do that, there's going to be problems. Objection sustained. <laughs> Boy, this guy blew up. Uh, what a, what a, what a freaking hothead. Mr. Mack... What you say happened in this particular case is you're living with Miss Ellis back in the summer of 2014, correct? Come again? Were you living with Miss Ellis during the summer of 2014? Are you saying, excuse me, I'm not understanding. Are you saying, did all this happen when I was living with Miss Ellis? No, sir. I'm not suggesting that. Okay. I'm just asking you. I'm trying to lay a foundation of whether or not you were living with Miss Ellis during the summer of 2014. Yes, I was. Okay. You were also living with her for the entire calendar year of 2014. That would have been last year. No. Okay. When did Miss Ellis remove herself from your residence? I had a stroke and I don't remember things. Do you recall when you had a stroke? I don't know. I think not really. Well, honestly, no. Okay. This alleged conversation that you supposedly had with Miss Ellis that you testified here today, was it prior to your stroke or was it subsequent to your stroke? It was after the stroke. Okay. So after the stroke, it's my understanding that Miss Ellis came home one evening and she was upset is your is under your testimony, correct? Yes. Okay. And then she told you at that point in time that she had been raped by an Oklahoma City police officer. Yes. Again, this Oklahoma City police officer, did she describe him to you in any way? As best she could. As best she could. What did she tell you? Policeman raped her. Did she did she tell you that it was a black policeman? She said she thought he was black. And had you ever seen that policeman in the neighborhood before? All the time. Okay. And so you believed it to be a black policeman? No. <laughs> What? Uh, what? What? <laughs> wow. That's contradictory. Well, in any event, after the, uh, she allegedly told you uh, these events, you said you encouraged her to go to get a DNA test, correct? Correct. And you told her that even you asked her specifically, 
How many sperms do you have in you? Yes. And did you suspect, suspect that she was doing something she should not be doing? No. <laughs> Wait okay. a minute. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But he had had a stroke and they weren't, according to Sherry Ellis, they weren't having sex. Yep. Because he had had a stroke. That's right. But he doesn't suspect her of doing anything No, she shouldn't be doing when she said she had two sperm in her. I, that's very... She, she, well, well you know maybe he is. was okay with it and it wasn't uh, something. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it wasn't wrong for him. Okay, yeah, that's true. You're, that's true. I mean, you know, some people don't care. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah, true. I mean, he okay. is quite a bit older than sherry and mm -hmm. maybe he really just wanted her to stay living there Com yeah. have the company yeah have somebody yeah, to be keeping keep, keep him company maybe i mean Possibly. maybe it's speculation yeah. but and, well, i, I mean that, it's really logical really. speculation though you're right yeah okay um but she told you but she told you there would be two correct Correct. And at any time, did you suggest that she save her clothing or her underwear or anything for future DNA testing? Well, having no forensic science experience, no. So you would agree with me that on a date, whenever it was, you don't know the specific day that she supposedly came home and told you these events, uh, correct? Um, not to be specific, no. You'd agree with me that, that they were the very first time you ever talked to the police, in this case about Officer Holtzclaw, was September the 15th of 2014. Well, whenever Miss somebody from the police department called me, I don't know the exact date, they called me over the phone. Okay. At any point in time during this investigation, did the police officers ever come... And see you face to face, the detectives. No. It was all over the telephone. Yeah. Do you know whether or not that phone call was recorded in any way? Yes. Did you record it? No, but I have the recording. Okay. Prior to the, uh, and who gave you the recording? When I came down here to be interviewed prior to the proceedings, they gave me that. What the hell? Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. I'm this assuming... Shade just gets darker and darker, man. Hey. Sorry. That's weird. <laughs> it is weird. Well, to that refresh his memory about what he said initially. Like here, to listen to this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Of course yeah. it was. Here, Working take here. this home and take this home and practice. Yep. Um, May I approach your honor? Yes. I'm assuming, Mr. Mack, that appears to be the police report that was generated in this case. I'm talking, have you actually received a copy of the phone call, this recording that you're saying that was made? This is it. Okay. And that's the police report. I just want to make sure that we're communicating. When I was stating or when I was asking whether or not you know whether or not it was recorded, do you have any independent knowledge of whether or not the phone call that you had had with the detective that had reflected on that report, whether or not it was recorded, meaning a recording device was hooked up and it was taped? Well, either she's got a dang good memory or it had to be recorded because it's verbatim what we discussed. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> wow, such big words. I'm so, I'm confused. Wait a minute. What, what recording is he talking about? When this Detective Davis, yeah. they asked, did Detective Davis, did he know if Detective Davis recorded the conversation when she called to interview him about his involvement and what Sherry said and when and all that. Yeah. 
And he says yep. yes. I mean, she should have recorded it just like she recorded well, yeah. Sherry Ellis when she called her. Right. Sure. She has right. the capability. Yep. Uh, so um, I guess where I'm confused is where he answers either she's got a dang good memory or it had to be recorded because it's verbatim what we discussed. I He's guess, a I guess. transcript. Yeah. 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 Or the okay. report. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I I dropped a couple of lines there. I'm sorry, carry on. Yeah, he's saying the police report, I guess, is what he has in his hand there, is verbatim okay. what he told her probably. during that call. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, either it's probably it got a trans Yeah, it's got yeah. a transcript, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. I'll have to, we'll have to look, Sheree, when you get that pulled up so we can look at it. Okay. okay, sorry. Carry on, 25. No, nope, no. Now, would you agree with me that it reflects that the first time you talked to the police in this case was September the 15th of 2014? Well, to be honest, I don't know exact the exact date, so I'm going to have to, if this stipulate that date, yes. What? <laughs> this what words are freaking me out, stipulate? Man. He's, got, he's throwing around some pretty big lawyer hospital. words here. I'm Perpetrator? telling you. Perpetrator? Stipulate? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's never been convicted of a felony. <laughs> Verbatim. Seems Verbatim, pretty familiar yeah. with the legal system. I don't know. He does. <laughs> okay. And I'm referring to the second, the, the very first line of the interview. Interview with Terry Mack on. Yes. September 15th of 2014. Is that the conversation that we're talking about? Yes. September the 15th of 2014, was Miss Ellis still living in your residence? No. Okay. When did Miss Ellis move out of your residence? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. If we use the, uh, the event when she allegedly told you something that happened, if we use that event as a benchmark, was she still living with you at that point in time? Yes. Okay. How long after she had this conversation with you did she move out? I guess two months. Okay. Approximately. At any point during that two month period of time that Miss Ellis lived with you, are you aware of Miss Ellis ever talking to the police, anyone with the Oklahoma City Police Department, about Officer Holtzclaw? No. And again, whenever you supposedly learned this information, you would agree with me that you did not report it or call the police in any way, correct? Correct. You also testified that you noticed a change in Miss Ellis' behavior after she talked to you about this event, correct? Correct. And were you aware of the fact that at that point in time that she had any sort of drug or alcohol problem? Not to my knowledge, she wasn't. I think she drank a little, but as far as any other drugs, not to my knowledge. Are you aware of her having a romantic relationship with another individual here in Oklahoma City? Subsequent to this, I am. Yes, and, and what was that individual's name? All I knew was Ed. Ed? Uh, did you ever have an opportunity to talk to Ed? Miss McConnell, objection, relevance. No, 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 no. Oh, I Long guess one. That's the wrong one. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, was I muted? Yeah, you were probably muted. <laughs> objection, relevance. Overruled. You can answer, sir. Did you ever have an opportunity to talk to Ed? Then, no. I had no reason to. Okay. After Miss Ellis supposedly told you these events had occurred, did you have an opportunity to seek out other individual, seek out other individual and talk to him? No. And to this day, you still have not? I've spoken mm -hmm. with him, but not in regard to that matter. Pass the witness, Your Honor. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. 
uh, Mr. Mack, Mr. Adams just asked you if you had ever reported to the police what had happened or if Ms. Ellis had. Do you remember that question? Come again? Do you remember Mr. Adams asking you if you had ever talked to police before that September 15th date? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And I think your answer was no, you had not. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Why didn't you tell police what had happened before September 15th? She was scared and didn't want to. Is the fact that Ms. Ellis was scared and didn't want to part of your reason for not talking to police? I didn't get raped. <laughs> okay. I'll pass the witness. All right. Thank you, sir. You'll be excused. If you'll assist, Mr. Mack. Wow. Call him Mr. Lawyer. Well, I really thought that they were going to try to clear up that recording thing, but they didn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Nope. Hmm. Yeah, that's... And, uh, I mean... So have you ever heard the recording? There's no... I mean, no, no recording was ever produced to the defense, so... Well, that's I mean, crap. So either... Yeah. Either he's saying that the police report sounds verbatim of the conversation he had with her. Uh, it's hard to know. I mean, was he is he smart enough to try to cover up what he said? I don't know. Well, you could really answer that question if you had a copy of that police report. And if there's a transcript attached, that means there's a recording. No, there's no transcript attached. I promise oh. you, no transcript. There's no okay. recording or transcript of this. So, okay. you know, we can read over the police report and see what he says in that. Um, yeah. yeah. Most police well, reports differ from trial testimony. Sure. I mean, most police reports differ between... The report, well, between if a recording exists, it's different from the recording. The officers leave, detectives leave out things that are exculpatory to Holtzclaw, or they uh -huh. change words to make it seem more damning, or they change words to use a word that another accuser used to try to, so the jury will think, oh, that's the same as she said but then it doesn't match the recording this is the and they, so, oh i'm sorry go ahead. go ahead and then there's there are times especially at, well probably with both of them but i remember it right now more with rocky where they put in little sentences to give it uh put their own what they think in it like instead of at exactly what the the or the victim said they, you know, put their own feelings in or what they think. Yeah. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. get what you're saying. Put their sure. spin on it, I guess. There you go. Yeah. Okay, do you want to read Edwin Smith's part of the police report or just go to Terry Mack? Let's do both of them. Okay, let me... It doesn't matter which one we start with. No, nah, it doesn't. Um, I mean, it might be better to start with Max since we just finished his testimony. Okay. Right, you just, um, I'm not seeing the same page numbers that you were. Okay, here it is. I was going by the numbers on the bottom. I don't know. You gotcha. know the okay. numbers. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Here it is. I got it. Um, let me share the screen. And hello and welcome to all of those who have joined since we've been chatting and going over testimony. Happy to have you here. Okay. So this is... Um, I can try to read this one. Um, excuse me.
excuse me. Okay, so this is in Sherry Ellis's police report, the interview with Terry Mack. By Kim Davis. Ninth, by Kim Davis, yes, thank you. On 9 15 14, I interviewed Terry Mack over the telephone. Terry is a 65 year old black male. He is disabled and in a wheelchair. He said he can get. He can get up and walk short distances, but cannot walk very far. Terry, what said does that wheelchair. matter? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that important? Yeah. Is I'm, there an is extra it? line in her? It's. I don't think it's important. But I find very little of what Kim Davis says important. So irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, Terry said he has known Sherry almost 20 years. They were a couple for about 19. He said they lived together a uh, majority of the 19 years. He said this incident caused them to break up. Well, I don't know that the... Two well, months know. later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but didn't he say it didn't bother him or she didn't do anything wrong or something like that? And done anything yeah. wrong. Yeah. 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 Uh, Terry said Sherry came home that night and told him a police officer raped her. She told him he drove down a dead end street, hopped the curb and drove on the Crescent Hill school property. And this really pisses me off because all we have, all we have is just what she's written here. We don't have the alleged recording. Right. So we just have to take her word for it, what he's saying, like in all the other reports. Uh, I asked Terry if Sherry told him what the officer did to her sexually. He said she told him he made her perform oral sodomy and did her from behind. Sherry told him the officer asked her, what are we going to do about these tickets? Huh. Did she though? <laughs> Terry said he asked if she wanted to do a rape kit. He told her police officer's DNA is on file, just like criminals, that that, that way... If they have, if they touch something at a crime scene, it won't be contaminated. Stupidest thing I've heard, but whatever. Uh, he said Sherry didn't want to have a rape exam. Terry asked if she had someone else's sperm in her. She said yes. He told her he has, he had, he told her she has been in trouble for prostitution and now she has two sperm in her. He said Sherry didn't want to go for the exam. He said she was afraid of what would happen as a result of reporting an officer for rape. He said she was paranoid for a few days and didn't want to leave the house. Then she said she wasn't going to let what he did make her stop seeing her friends. That is not at all what she says in her telephone interview or in her recorded interview with Davis, but whatever, or what she testified to. Um, Terry said whenever Sherry left the house, he would see the police car parked down the street on Miramar. <laughs> he said he would go sit on the porch and could see the officer par park watching through Sherry. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. He well, if it's the black guy, maybe. Yeah, I mean, if it was, for sure. <laughs> He would see cars run a stop sign and the officer wouldn't go after them. And that is why he thought he was watching for her. He kept telling Sherry the officer was going to hurt her and she needed to stay Jeez. on the streets. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he told her that officers all stick together and her word would not count for anything over this. <sighs> Terry oh, yes. said the officer would drive through the area all the time. He told Sherry. The officer was looking for her and to be careful. Terry said he stopped going outside for fear of trouble with the officer. He said this is the reason he moved because he didn't know what the officer or his friends would do. What? Whatever. I don't know about that. So that's interesting. I mean... Thank goodness none of that kind of shit came up in trial. I mean, obviously, I don't know, man. Can you imagine? All right, Sherry, or Sherry, what was that other page? She didn't ask him about the officer's race. Did she? No. 68. 
<laughs> yeah. And they were just two pages apart. Oh, okay. 67, 60. Back up. Uh, 68. Go up. You're on 69 right now. And then the one before that is Edwin, where he starts. Um, okay. Oh, okay. There it is. Sorry, guys. Okay, so then this one is the interview with Edwin Smith, the boyfriend. On 9 12 14, I contacted Edwin Smith over the telephone. He is Sherry Ellis's boyfriend. Edwin is currently on federal supervised probation for narcotics. His probation officer is Carrie at whatever number. Edwin said he and Sherry have been talking since August 2013. He was living, she was living with Terry Mack at the time, but they were also seeing each other. He said Sherry and Terry lived around the corner from his mother's house on 1705 Miramar. And I have found that on a map. Um, and also Sherry and Edwin moved right next door to 1705 on Miramar next to his mother. So just little fun facts. Um, Edwin confirmed Edwin confirmed he and Sherry had consensual sex the night she was assaulted uh, by Officer Holtzclaw. He said Sherry. He said Sherry came to his house. He lived with his mother at the time. They hung out together and they had consensual sex. He did not wear a condom and he ejaculated inside of her. He said Sherry left his house on foot. She told him she was going home. He later found out that she didn't want to go home, so she started walking to her cousin's house somewhere near Highland. Oh. So, albeit a small lie, there is a lie in there. Um, Edwin said about one month after Sherry was assaulted, she told him about it. She said, quote, unquote, I got raped. He replied, quote, no, you didn't. Who raped you, end quote. She said, I got raped by a police officer. He replied, no, you didn't. She said he was, she said he is a black guy and it happened next to a school. Edwin said, Edwin said she started crying and she said she couldn't see the number on the police car. Uh, she told him, she thought it was the officer who was always in the neighborhood. Edwin asked her if she told anyone about it. Sherry told him she told Terry the night it happened, and she said that Terry wanted her to go have a rape exam, but she told him no. She said Terry asked her why she wouldn't have an exam and asked if she had sex with someone else. Sherry said she told Terry the truth um, and admitted she had sex with someone else. She said Terry told her they couldn't detect if she was raped or not because she has two sperms in her. Edwin said he does not know if Sherry and Terry broke up because of their relationship. He said that that is something that I need to talk to Sherry about. Edwin told me he has to con contact his probation officer anytime he has contact with the police. I told him. I would contact her and advise her what is going on. He gave me her name and telephone number. And I was able to make contact with her and tell her the reason for his contact with the police. I don't know. I mean, I, I just see small inconsistencies, honestly. Um, I don't know that I really see anything. you know, overwhelming, you know, that, I don't know, that's just me. Anybody else? Hey, sorry, I got sidetracked over here with something else. So okay, I'm, I was thinking, I was I'm just not, starting I'm, to think. I'm, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, 
I guess what you guys think. I didn't really feel like there was anything overwhelming, you know, some small inconsistencies, but I don't feel like there's anything that would, you know, make a, a huge difference really. So the whole upset and crying and all of that, the whole demeanor thing that each guy testified to was that in the police reports? No. So no, that, like, uh -uh. that that's the main thing that that Giger and McConnell were trying to use these two witnesses for. Mm -hmm. And those things weren't in the police report. Right. So yeah. yeah and which is you know, I kind of have to give Terry Mack credit that he said the police lie about things i mean we know the police lie but you know <laughs> yeah that's about as far yeah. as i can go for him <laughs> i have to agree that they do but yeah i was thinking that as you guys were reading that i was like yeah that's true <laughs> well you know i i tend to believe that she probably was raped by a black cop I don't know. That's pretty much yeah. what I tend to believe too, Susan. It wasn't Daniel, for certainly. I I believe that as well, and I just think I think the turning point for her going along with this was when Kim Davis told her, "Sherry, mm -hmm. if I didn't believe you, I wouldn't have been trying to find you." And mm -hmm. Sherry, I know which officer did this to you. Yeah. And then after that is when she gives the root. You know, we don't we don't have Davis didn't record the car ride where they took Sherry they took her so she could show them the mm -hmm. route. We don't have that recording. So we don't know if she was confused about why they're using the location that is a traffic stop that she had recently been involved in. A traffic stop, a, a Terry stop, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, amazing. it's, and unfortunately, as far as we know, there was no AVL taken of any other police officer that might have been working in anywhere in the vicinity of that sector that night. But that wasn't the goal anyway. Um, well, more than likely, it didn't happen on that day. Right. Exactly. Um, what, what are the chances what I, it's going to happen on a day? And she would have been freaked out if she had already been raped. Okay. Yeah. It didn't happen on that day because after she alleges that she was raped, she went straight back to the house. And she didn't leave the house or anything, right? Is she the one yeah. who says that she didn't walk right. around anymore in the daytime? Or yeah. am I confusing her in with... The night. Yeah, she, didn't yeah, she said she quit outside. going out at night. If she didn't have her groceries or her stuff at the at the store done before it That's got right. dark, she, she just didn't do it. And she made it sound like it was... had That was ongoing from the time that it occurred to the time to that very time during the phone, during her phone interview. That was my impression that for all these months, she hasn't been going out anymore at night. But Terry Mack said that, you know, she stopped going out for a few days. And then according to him, he was telling her, girl, you got to stay off the streets at night. He's out there. I see him. He's watching, watching for you. He's going to hurt you. You got to stop going out. That's not the impression that, I got listening to her interviews at all. So 
I just I think, know. you know, Kim Davis could have told her, Sherry, you know, being raped can can um, really traumatize you. And trust me, it happened here and on this date. I know who did this to you. So trust me, you're traumatized. Yep. You're not remembering correctly or something like that. Yep. I completely agree with that. And she went along with it because she probably did think that she, well, I must have mis made a mistake then. And, uh, yeah, the, you know, well, she did. I mean, she couldn't even identify Daniel in court uh, during preliminary hearing. So, you know, and according to her in her deposition, she didn't know who it was that even raped her until they went to trial. So, I mean, I think they, those are just some of the reasons why I feel like Sherry Ellis's uh, story is so, I don't know, important isn't the right word, but so, uh, so much bigger or something than the others because there's a lot of, um, I don't know, there's just a lot of, uh, secretive shady shit that went on from beginning to uh at least to the trial when she realized oh this is who they're saying raped me i don't know a lot a lot went on and those are the things that you know brian bates i almost said brian adams brian bates uh you know points out in episode nine of of his podcast so um uh, Justine J says, but how do they justify the fact that he, she said he was black, but Daniel is not. It's very confusing. Um, uh, it's dark out there. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I, like, like, like Susan was saying a few minutes ago, I think Kim Davis convinced her that, uh, you know, it was dark, Sherry. It was one o'clock in the morning when this happened. And, uh, you know, you you it, you just think he was black. It, it, he really isn't black, though. And, what, and, you know, again, to Susan's point, she probably, at that point in time, thought, okay, yeah, you're probably right then. But... I think that's the only way it's justified. Well, um, you know, I, think, I don't know. I honestly think that she didn't understand that Daniel was white, that her, the person that they were saying raped her. I don't think she even got that. It was Daniel that, I don't know. I don't know. There was so much um, coverage on, on TV, maybe. Maybe I'm wrong, but didn't she say she had never seen him before court? Uh -huh. She scary? says in her deposition. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like she didn't even really understand what was going on. I don't know. She didn't recognize him in court, of course. She was probably right. looking for a, a black guy. That's yeah. Probably, probably why. Yeah. Yeah, um, I should put the link to that eight-minute video clip in the chat so that people can go watch it. Um, just because it's so, it's even it becomes even more impactful again. You know, after now we've read all the trial testimony and we've what? gone through. At, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you in the sentence. I'm bad about that. Well, I'm sure it was important. So. No, I was just going to say we should end the podcast with that and play it if you have it handy. Oh, yeah, whenever, I can get it. Well, whenever you get ready to end the podcast. but Yeah, I'll see if I can find it while we're chatting. I mean, I know I can find it. But, um, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know, you know, it just... It's just because there's so much, there's so many questions 
around her entire story that just aren't logical to me. They just, it, the things just don't make sense to me. And so I think that's why I get all twisted with her case, her story. And, you know, and when I was, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Sheree. I was just going to make one comment that um, she, it, it, the all the inconsistencies, and then it's she's the one he got the most years for. So it's very uh, upsetting. They okay. split the baby. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they sure did. <laughs> I was just going to say, her, her, I think by the time she was in depositions, she knew that she had helped send the wrong guy to prison for 62 years. I thought, oh, she's being a pathetic crybaby trying to get sympathy. I think she was tearful that whole time because of guilt. That's what I, that's, yeah, I absolutely feel that, feel that way. Because, and you know what, you're right, um, Kay, because... It was, she cried through just about the entire deposition, as I recall. Um, she was quite upset during the whole thing. Um, not necessarily like boohoo crying, like she was at that part at the end, but the she was real very tears. tearful. Real yeah, but tears. real tears, yeah. Yeah, real tears. Uh, Justine J asked, did the defense ever show her photos of all the black cops in the station? No. No, they didn't. Of any cops in the station. This is one case where I feel like a photo lineup might have been uh, beneficial, which is why I feel like they couldn't show her a, a photo lineup. Because she's looking for a black man, she's not going to pick Daniel. But that's my opinion. So... Yeah, it's a pretty, her case is pretty significant. And like, you know, like we've, like it's been mentioned already, the 62 years on his charges. I, I don't know how now I have, my sympathy has waned for her because she now, she now knows or definitely did by the time of her deposition, if not sooner, that she, she accused the wrong man. And I don't know how she sleeps at night. Well, they all know that, but. She's one of the more um, mentally or emotionally or something uh, together, I guess you could say, of all of them. And um, I just feel like her conscience should be weighing on her a lot more. But I'm being very judgmental. That's not fair. Um, but I really don't care because she is a liar. And what she's done to an innocent man is disgusting. So anyway, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I've got that pulled up. I, I, won't, I don't have it loaded, but we can watch it from, uh, from yeah. the browser. So um, sure. <laughs> any other comments or questions or anything about Sherry Ellis and her story? Great questions, by the way. Thank you, Justine. Not for me. Uh, Stover 76. I'm not sure. I recall seeing you in our chat before, but you're sending a sick face. Um, I am hoping that's because you feel sick about what's been done to Daniel. <laughs> and welcome. Um, Justine also asks or says it would be interesting to see if any black cops were sacked or moved from that police station since this case? Well, um, <laughs> I don't, Kay, do you want to talk about Alexander Edwards? Or, I mean, it was two years after, but still. Yeah, but so Alexander Edwards is a short black officer who a couple years after Daniel's conviction was charged with basically blowing up a, a 
oh, what do you call it? Like undercover sting, sting operation that involved prostitution and, and was it human trafficking, I believe? Yes. And he told one of the prostitutes he had been sleeping with, a, he gave her a heads up that it was getting ready to happen. So he just completely destroyed, I don't know how many months or years they had been working on this, but he completely blew it up. He was working. Okay. So once again, I agree with Susan. If she was raped by a police officer, it wasn't that night. And so all we know is that that night, May 7th, he was working in just in the adjacent area. I can't remember the terminology about what you call the different areas, if it's a it was, sector. It was or just a, north, north of uh, where Daniel was. Yeah, it was just right. it was, I mean, yeah, it was the next sector north, exactly. Um, but I think that here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to accuse every short black officer of being the officer. I don't want to accuse people of being the person without any evidence or any invest. I just, you know, okay. Yeah. This, this guy did some illegal stuff and he was sleeping with prostitutes, but I mean, is he a serial rapist? I don't want to call someone not a any more than rapist. Daniel was. Yeah, no, of course not. I mean, and, and but I just feel like if there's a possible, and they don't use it this this term in Oklahoma, it's a different case, and I can't. Cherie will remember. I don't. Uh, but it's a possible third party, um, third party, uh, pos third party liability or whatever they call it. General perpetrator yeah it's a possible one uh that that wasn't investigated to our knowledge so that's the only reason that yeah i agree i mean you know because of what's been done to daniel we can't absolutely can't you know just blatantly blame somebody else or accuse somebody else uh, um so i definitely um, I w definitely want to address Stover76. Um, thank you again for your comments. I, I truly appreciate it. And I'm happy to address, uh, at, or any panel members or anybody in the chat can also address it. Um, but he, Stover76 says that they are sick at uh, my theory, our theory on this. Uh, completely respect that. Um, and uh, because that's what this is, it's all a theory. Uh, you know, well, you're sure. right. Yeah, yeah you're right. It is. It's absolute, because we don't have proof. We weren't there. Is, exactly. So we, it is all a theory. Um, but I think it's fair to present both sides. The one, the one side has already been told. Um, the mainstream media told you everything that they wanted you to see and hear or the public to see and hear and uh, the trial and the trial. And so that's all I'm doing here. Stover is I'm just presenting the, the information that we've obtained uh, that absolutely occurred at trial uh, based on, on the trial testimony and police reports and uh i'm not presenting both sides i'm absolutely not i don't need to present the other side i can't present the other side because it's already been presented what i can do though what i what i can do though is share what we have found in the police reports and in all of the testimony and other documents that we've obtained and when I see, when any of us see an inconsistency or a blatant, complete blatant lie, then I, that's what I can show. And that's all I'm doing. Just showing you. 
And because you also, you know, we don't just read, you know, part of the testimony of the testimonies of the testimony. Um, oh, sorry, Strover, I apologize. Um, I, I didn't uh, catch that, that R there. Um, uh, but, but I just think it's fair to, uh, you know, share the side that we're learning, that we're investigating, that we're researching, uh, because, you know, for whatever reasons, that absolutely wasn't done in the mainstream media, number one. Number two, you know, not everything in at the trial and the preliminary and in the police reports uh, was necessarily um, told in the in the truth, <laughs> truthfully. I, I don't know any other way to say it. And well, so, when you, um, and we know when that. You, yeah, when you have when you have an initial interview and you say these things and then you get you get subpoenaed to the preliminary hearing and your testimony changes from your initial statement and then at trial your testimony changes yet again to match the prosecution's narrative, then yeah, yeah, you're going to question it. You should question it. Why is that happening? You know, why did their memory get better with time? That's not how memory works. I mean, you know. Um, okay. I don't know what yeah, else to say. I agree. Uh, Strober says, my point is, I don't uh, do listen to MSM. So my view isn't from there. It's from his interrogation. Oh, okay. 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 And, you know, there's, unfortunately or fortunately, I guess, depending on which side you're on, a lot of people make a judgment of guilty or an innocence judgment based on just interrogation videos alone. And that's, in my opinion, unfair. I, I watch a lot of interrogation videos. I'm fascinated by them. I find them very interesting. Um, but I don't, I don't look, I don't go into those videos that I like to watch, assuming that the person uh, is guilty or or even watch the entire thing and assume that the person is guilty. I don't go, I don't buy into the whole body language thing and all of that stuff. I just don't. I mean. That is not proof yeah. of guilt. Watching it, yeah, it's an not, interrogation. It's, yeah. Well, it's not. What I'm you did, I mean, proven. you could probably make a more informed decision if you actually knew the person if you knew them very well and you knew, you know, their, how they speak, if you knew their little ticks and tells, you know, people roasted Daniel for saying what not so many times. Well, that's just something Daniel said before and he still says what not. I mean, People thought he was saying what not while he was thinking about what to say or whatever. But that's one of the things that, um, you know, people judged him on. Well, I mean, so Strover, you think he's guilty based on the two hour interview? Is, I mean, is that right? That's what he said. Yeah. His view is from his interrogation. Well, I mean, then you do go assuming because there's a lot more information to <laughs> analyze, Tons. to draw your opinion. I mean, and that, yeah. I mean, go ahead. that information is out there now for people to find. Yeah. And we're showing uh, one week at a time, one document at a time, one, uh, you know, information that we have. Um, I, well, I, well, 
like Kay was saying, um, first of all, I do know Daniel. Um, I've come to know Daniel, I guess is a better thing to say. Um, and oh, sorry, Strover. Oh, I, I knew that was, I knew that was <laughs> I apologize. Like, I'm you sorry. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> Jesus. Oh. <man. laughs> I apologize, Strover. Um, uh, but I, I, um, I discount the interrogation because, well, like I said, because I, I, I now know Daniel and like Kay said, I am very familiar with his mannerisms and his, his thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the grace. I, I'm not, I'm not always, you know, aware of certain things. So I appreciate that Strober. Um, and so I've become familiar with the way he speaks, the way he, the words he uses. And as far as the word whatnot, I use whatnot before I ever even heard Daniel's interrogation video. And I hear a lot of people use that same word. So it is really sad that he was judged on that too, as much as he has been. But also, but also the things oh, in the interrogation there were more things in the interrogation that Liggins got caught mm -hmm. saying incorrect information. Right. I mean, she did not turn around in a parking lot when she got ready to go. She didn't pull into a parking lot at all. And I know the detective said that they found his pubic hair in the back of his cruiser like all detectives, they can they are allowed, are allowed to, lie. to lie during an interrogation. The general public believes that when they see that two-hour interview, they absolutely believe that they found his pubic hairs in the back of the cruiser. They just did not. That was they were That's dismissing it. Right. Um I mean, she yeah. says that she put, he made her put her hands on the car in a specific place and that he placed his hands on the car in a specific place. There was, there were no prints or DNA to in the back dust. the story up. And he said that that did not happen. The evidence supported him in that. I mean, I'm really interested I'm interested to hear the things in the interview that were really, um, that really made you feel like he was guilty. What, what were the thing, what were some of the things yeah. that really made you feel like he was guilty or he was lying? Also, I think it's uh, while we're waiting for uh, Strover to respond, hopefully we'll respond. Um, I, I, it's also important to remember that Kim Davis, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you would have to, <laughs> sorry, you would have to ask, uh, uh Janie Liggins that question. No, here's what she said. said. She said that he put his hands on top of the car to kind of, cause two vehicles, drove by the area you can see the lights in the uh there's a really oh, yeah. grainy <laughs> really grainy surveillance um video from the insurance company building where they were stopped in front of and so Liggins was explaining that when the car drove by he put his hands on top of the car to kind of hide what was going on because he was standing so, right in front of her door her yeah open door on a busy street supposedly. even though it was the middle of the night you know uh, if you're from oklahoma city you know 50th and lincoln is a busy Major. intersection is exposed yeah mm -hmm. yeah but I also want to make, you know, point this out as well, um, that Kim Davis said um, that she she believed Janie Liggins 
in the hospital, in the emergency room, as she said, as soon as Janie told her 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 story, she believed her. She knew in her gut that Janie Liggins was telling her the truth. And I, she basically admits um, uh, that, you know what? Thank you so much, Strover. Um, Strover says, I'm actually impressed. This is live. I appreciate you, ladies. Um, and Jack. <laughs> Jack's usually quieter. <laughs> Um, but thank you. That really is, I really do appreciate that because you, you're at least willing to have an open mind and listen to what we have, you know, to listen to the answers to the questions that you're posing and things like that. That's impressive to me. So thank you. Um, but she went into this entire thing. <laughs> there you go, Jack. <laughs> um, they, she went into, before she even talked to um, Officer Holtzclaw, she went into that interview interrogation already believing Janie Liggins. And she says that in, in other interviews that she's given um, in different documentaries and stuff like that. So that's not necessarily the way a police officer should enter into an investigation by already believing that everything that the, the alleged victim is saying is the truth. That's not the way to enter because that's not objective. So, um, and that's just one reason uh, why. And uh, and then I'm going to just go all the way to nearly the end of the interrogation video because honestly, everything in the middle really is less impactful on me other than it was just kind of, even if you want to just call it police talk and, you know, trying to get the guy to feel comfortable or whatever, you can call it that, that's fine. Um, that, um, that she, that's investigation. I didn't know. Um, you didn't know about what Kim Davis had said before the interview, uh, before the interrogation. Uh, but anyway, when, so everything in the middle is, uh, it's important, but it's less consequential to me than what happened at the end when Daniel uh, said that he had um, gone home that night and tried to have sex with his girlfriend. Um, he didn't say he had sex with his girlfriend. He said he tried and she shut him down and he was like, cool, whatever. And, you know, went, went to bed, went to sleep. Um, and then for Kim Davis to make this big deal about call, catching him in a lie, she went outside of the room and called Daniel's girlfriend and identified herself, I'm sure, but then just um, starts asking these personal questions. She's at the gym or she was at work and he, she just, I, I'm just calling, I'm detective. Out of the blue. Just, right. Out of the blue. <laughs> and if, if if I, if that ever happened to me and somebody called, I don't care who they identified themselves as, I would be saying, uh, I don't know who you are. Um, I, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> so, um, you know, but she did it twice. And, and, uh, you know, that was, so I'm not surprised that she would tell somebody on the phone no, that didn't happen, or whatever the answer really was that that um, that his girlfriend gave to Detective Davis. So, but then Kim Davis waited until that one thing. Now I caught you in a lie, and now I don't know what to believe. What? <laughs> yes, that is the yeah, that is that was the con. Well, that's the context that uh, Kim Davis gave us. Um, you know, that's her context um, uh, of what of what happened. Um, there and, was also you know, no DNA from Janie Liggins. No DNA. Um, same, no, same yeah. kid. No, yes. no forensic evidence on Janie, you know, regarding Janie Liggins whatsoever. Um, and uh, I don't know. I just... I don't know. I just didn't feel like 
you know, as much as they tried to get him to confess to something, um, because I do know Daniel now, um, nothing about him has ever made me think that he might be whole. He's an open book. But, uh, he, he wants questions asked. He wants to, because he wants to be, he wants to get his information out there. Um, you know, so uh, he, he also wanted all the tests they could do. He did. Yeah. Uh, Strober, please understand that I'm not on a side. I'm as much after the truth as you are. Thank you. It's so refreshing to have somebody come in and chat and comment with an open mind because that's really all it takes. It just takes an open mind and a, and a willingness to say, well, oh, you know, what if, you know, what if there is another side to this that I missed or I didn't understand or I've never heard before? Um, and, and even further than that, being willing to at some point say, okay, now I'm sitting on the fence at least, you know, and then perhaps, at, you know, after more information, okay, now I'm, now I'm off of the fence standing next to it on one side or the other. And, you know, just baby steps. And really that's all that we're doing every week is just giving um, the side that, you know, this, this trial wasn't televised. So um, there's very little information, very little information that's accurate uh, given in any news clips. Um, I appreciate that. And we will answer any questions you have any questions that you have, if we know the answer for a fact and we have, you know, information that backs that up, we'll tell you that. If we don't know the truth or we don't know the facts, just like when we were talking about um, the black officer, Alexander Edwards, it's speculation. We don't know, like Kay says, we have no idea if he was involved in Sherry Ellis's situation. Um, and so, you know, but he he matched the description that Sherry Ellis gave. Absolutely. So, um, hey, I'll Strover, admit, only a really interrogation, a really quick way, or the quickest way to kind of get up to speed with most of this case is to listen to a podcast. It's uh, it's called Bates. B A T E S investigates, and he follows the timeline of the prosecution, but he um, he uses he with the scrutiny of the defense. So he obviously is on the defense side. He obviously believes in Dan Daniel's innocence. He was the private investigator. Uh, he's been a private investigator for a few decades, um, but he really gives even a lot more background on the Oklahoma City Police Department and the like, the history of the city and the culture. Um, he really does a great job with that podcast. And then Rhonda just posted HoltzClawTrial.com, which is his website and so you can listen to the podcast but then you can go to holtzclawtrial.com and he has all of the documents all that he has all of the supporting evidence that he uses in each podcast so that you can go and read the entire police report yourself you can see the maps, you can see photographs, you can see all the supporting evidence for each episode. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, to listen to that and, um, and go check out the documents too, uh, because it's really enlightening. Yeah, I, I can't, like I have chills right now. I'm so excited. I wish we had more people like Strover come to watch our live videos and in and ask questions in the chat. 
because if there's, if I can just reach, even if it's just one person a month um, and get one person a month or a week, preferably, but a day would be preferable. But if I can just get one person to um, say, well, I didn't know that, or I haven't seen that before, or, I haven't heard that before, or where can I find whatever, uh, that, that means that that's a big deal. Um, it's so much more productive than some comments that we occasionally get that are just negative where people will say he's guilty, he did it, he's right where he belongs. And, and then I, when I ask, well, what makes you think that? What makes you say that? What, you know, talk to me, tell me. So, you know, let me know so I can help answer some questions for you. Nope, he's guilty. That's it. I, I, I watched the interrogation video or I saw everything on the news or I read all the articles and that's okay. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. It wasn't enough for us. So we started doing a lot more digging. Kay's been digging for, for the entire time that Daniel's been in prison, seven, eight years now. Um, and uh, I, the rest of us have been for probably over three years now working with Kay, uh, you know, doing the digging. And so uh, because it's not enough for me to just see a few things or, you know, hear a few things or whatever. I want to I want to I'm very nosy and I want to know the, all the stuff. <laughs> so um, I think we skipped a few of the Justine's questions. Oh, I'm so sorry, Justine. I'm so I'm sorry, Justine. Um, yeah, it's been that long. It's really sad, Justine. I'm really sorry. Um, she says, uh, "How uh, how did they justify the fact that she said he was black, but Daniel oh. is not? It's very confusing. Did the defense ever show her photos of all the black cops in the station? No, that yeah, we talked about. We did answer those questions. It might have been when you stepped yeah. away." <laughs> <laughs> the de oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I was on the. Okay, I apologize. I'm sorry, but yeah, I think we did. I hopefully we answered your questions uh, satisfactorily. Oh. Sorry, my Please mom's calling. Music. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, mom. Uh, uh, yeah, and so um, yeah, it has. It's been that long. Yeah. Well, we're getting we're closing in on uh, eight uh, nine years now. Um, in December, so did you uh, all mention Daniel in the den as well? Oh, I did not. Um, Strover, have you seen uh, Daniel in the den on YouTube? YouTube. I'll get the uh, I'll get the link for that as well um, because That's it's a little easy. It's kind of an overview. And what is it? Is it yeah. two hours or? Uh, uh, close to that. Um, oh, okay. Let me get you that. Um, listen, Strover, if you come back, uh, if you keep coming back every week, you'll learn that I am extremely wordy. <laughs> I'm a chatterbox. And, uh, so, you know, that's just how I am. Um, let me get you this link. Ah, what's happening? Um, But yeah, I, and you know what? Um, asking questions and getting not necessarily get the answer you're thinking you're going to get or you're looking for or you're hoping for, but just getting an answer, um, you know, that's the, asking questions is the best, um, the best thing. So uh, you're always welcome to come to our, to this podcast and ask questions. Uh, we do it every um, we do it every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central, and so um, you know I encourage you as you have time and as it's um, you know possible for you, uh, you know come back and and you know listen to more. And um, beyond that, I don't know if you've looked through the channel uh, through my channel. Um, Okay, here's a link to Daniel in the Den. Uh, it's just another thing to look at to, you know, make you ask more questions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, 
don't be sorry. I want you to ask all the questions you want to ask. And even if everybody else has got to go or gets tired or they're hungry, I'll sit here and talk to you guys, anybody about all night uh, answering questions. Um, or also, I guess I might as well do this too. I don't know if you're, um, if you're familiar with Discord or not, Strober, uh, but there is a Discord um, that I have that we don't do a, I mean, it's not really an active, active Discord, but we do, um, you know, there's a room in Discord for each accuser. And so as we get information or we do, you know, trial transcripts or whatever, we put them in their rooms. Um, and so, um, let me put, ah, I keep hitting the wrong button and it makes my page go all wonky. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to come in there too and see what we have in there. And uh, if you're familiar with it. And here's the invite for that. You're very new to Discord. Okay, yeah, I mean, check it out. And, um, you know, I, the rooms aren't as organized as I would like them to be. I actually need to get some help from my panel members up here. <laughs> uh, and, you know, have, get that reorganized a little bit. But join the Discord. Um, ask questions there. Um, but I'm telling you, uh, I, when, um, I mean, I'll mention your questions to Daniel and he's going to be excited about it. I can guarantee it. He wants to know, um, he wants, he wants you to know, he wants all of his supporters to know, even people who don't support him yet or ever, he just wants them to know I have a side too. And I made a mistake of not asking for an attorney. Uh, when I was in my interrogation, he knows that. He obviously knows that now. That's just how naive Daniel was, though, honestly, at the time. Um, he just, you know, he was very naive. And he, he not that he, <laughs> this always gets twisted when I make this comment to people, too. It's not that he thought that they were going to protect him. It's that he, he believed he could trust them to do an investigation, a proper investigation. And uh, they would find out that there was no possible way he was involved in this and that it would all be cleared up just like Kim Davis told him it would be. Uh, and that, you know, chalk it up to a, you know, a really ugly experience he had to go through. And, you know, by damn, next time something like that happens, I'm getting an attorney, you know, right away. And, um, you know, so he knows that he there were some mistakes. He wishes that he had testified in his own defense uh, at trial. But just like most other defendants, even even the in, even the guilty ones, uh, you know, they trust what their attorney's advice is. And you know, his attorney's advice was to not testify. You know, and he was paying for an attorney, and that was the advice that he took. So. Um, yeah, you know, uh, Strober, I'm just happy there's females who understand that questions are good. Well, yeah. Uh, let me just tell you this much. The five of us here on this panel, we are all very inquisitive. We all have a lot of questions. And um, none of us are really very keen to just sit back and be quiet and not try to... Um, get involved. So that's all we're doing. I'm just trying to, you know, get that information out there. That's all that my channel has ever been about was getting information out. And, you know, honestly, in the beginning, the first videos that I did, you know, in the beginning, they're, they're pretty rough. They're pretty bad, but I was learning. I was trying to teach myself, but I think especially the best thing I can suggest to you right now, after you listen to uh, Bates podcasts, um, Daniel in the Den, and check out HoltzClawTrial.com. Go back to about 11 or 12 weeks ago. Well, this is episode 14. So go back 14 weeks ago 
and I start all over with the case. Um, there's a video about uh, Daniel Holtzclaw for beginners. Thank you. I appreciate that. Daniel Holtzclaw for beginners. And, and then we just kind of following Bates investigation just are slowly week by week going through all of the information for each accuser um, as you know as we go and i think that's where i would recommend to have you start <laughs> if you're gonna you know at, at some point start going through these videos um that's just my suggestion but definitely yes look into the other ones first for sure um I'm really sorry I'm rambling because I'm really excited. So I'm going to stop talking and let the rest of the panel make their comments. <laughs> so I think what we're going to do, um, and hopefully you'll really find this uh, interesting, Strover, I'm going to play a video about Sherry Ellis, um, and it's self explanatory. So I'm just going to share the screen here and we're going to watch this video and, um, you know, you can leave a comment in the comment section if you want and tell us how you feel about it. Um, but I have all these other tabs open. Let me see just to let you know, Strover, we're here every Thursday at 5 PM central. Um, Pretty much every Thursday. I'm not sure if this is the one. I have so many. Let me close these other tabs out really quick because I've got too many tabs open to recognize this. Okay. So we're going to play this video and then um, we are going to get out of here and let my panel go and let the rest of you go and uh, definitely like and sh like and subscribe like you just did Strover and um, uh, you know leave us some comments or ask some more questions in the comment section. I look at them every day so. Is your sound muted? No. Oh. Is this Sherry? Yes. Sherry, this is Detective Davis. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You sound frantic in your messages. Oh yeah, because I because I don't know because I don't know what's going on. It's okay. That's why I, that's why I've been wanting to find you and just ask you something. Okay. Okay. I have received a tip. On, I've been working. I work in sex crimes, and I've been working some cases. And I received a tip that you may have been sexually assaulted by a police officer. Yes, I have. But I, I didn't say anything because I didn't because I know that the pol I know police department and police say it's all stick together. Well, we ain't sticking together on this one. Oh, uh, okay. So I would like to interview you. I didn't ever get his badge number. I don't know anything. I was terrified. I just didn't know what was going on because he, I was, he, he, was, he said, I'll do that. Or he was going to, I don't know. I didn't know whether if I still did it nope. or is he going to take me to jail or what. He was a black man. Okay. He was in a black and white police car. Sherry, I believe you. If I didn't believe you, I wouldn't have been calling you, trying to find you. Okay. Let me ask you this. You give me, tell me your description of him. He's black. He's, okay. He's black male. Muscular. Muscular. How tall could you tell? You're pretty tall. How tall are you? 
How tall are you? 5'11". Is he taller than you or shorter than you? Like right here, maybe. Like that. So you think he's shorter than you? Yeah. Okay. What kind of car did he have? A black and white one. Black and white car? Oklahoma City police car. Okay. Well, let me let me tell you this. I want to get a DNA sample from you today. And the reason I want to get a DNA sample is because I know what officer did this to you. Okay. And there is some unknown female DNA on his pants that I took. And I want to see if it's yours. This is a waiver saying that you are going to let me, Kim Davis, and I'm a detective and this is where we're located, are going to let me take buckle swabs. It's just Q-tips on the inside of your mouth to get a DNA sample so I can compare it to the DNA on his pants. Okay. One more question. When you described him as a black male, what, and I don't know, everybody's like, what it, are you? Are you a medium color? What's your skin tone to you? Mm, I'm light. You're light. Okay. What was he? He's darker. He's darker than you? Darker than your skin tone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you raise your right hand, please? If you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and if you live the truth, say help you God. I do. You state your full legal name? Sherry Louise Michelle Smith. Who, who contacted you? If Kim you Davis. Detective Davis? Yes, sir. Okay. And where did she, did she call you on the phone, or did she meet you in person? She called me on the phone. Okay. And what did you tell her on the phone? She asked me if I had any, uh, any, uh, she asked me if I had any, had any problems with the police, with the police officer. And I told her, yes. Did you meet her in person after the phone call? Yes, sir. And where did that meeting take place? The DA's in that building next to the courthouse. Okay. How tall are you? Uh, uh, 5'11". 5'11". All right. And do, do you recall explaining to Miss Davis how tall this officer was that assaulted you? Yes, I do. Okay. And I, I'm going to hand you another exhibit. We marked it as exhibit number four. Um, that's a video still of you explaining to the officer how tall the person was that assaulted you. Do you recognize yourself in that image? Yes, sir. Is that you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. Now, how how tall did you tell the, was the person that assaulted you? I don't recall how, how tall I said he was, but mm -hmm. I, I did say that he was shorter than I was. And we say shorter than you by about how much? I mean, in, in that image, it looks like you're holding your hand up maybe to your shoulders. Yeah. So he came up to about your shoulders. Yeah. Uh, so maybe what, five, 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 six. Yes. A shorter man. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And how else would you physically describe the officer? other than by height? I had uh, said that he was uh, black. He was dark complected. Mm -hmm. I think black is what I said. I'm marking this plaintiff's exhibit A. I have a copy for you here. Uh, Miss Alice, do you recognize this individual? Yes, I do. Okay. How do you recognize that person? From court. Okay. Do you recognize that person from any other time in your life? No. At the time you were at trial, did you believe you had seen that individual before? No. 
when I seen him. During trial, that's when I seen him. Okay. Had you had any previous interactions with that man, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Besides uh, him. What him. It's besides, you know, I, I, I have never seen him but before trial. That's when I finally seen who uh, accused of raping me. Okay. Um, so there's the, I can't play that video enough. I think it's very informative, very telling. Um, and so we are going to end the podcast for this week there. And um, I think we've covered everything now with Sherry Ellis. And so I believe the next um, accuser that we will start talking about, uh, Cherie, is it Florine Mathis or Sarita Bowen? I believe it's Florine. Um, Sarita's okay. toward the end. Yeah, okay. Oh, I don't even think Brian Bates even got to Sarita, did he, in his podcast? No. Okay. All right, so next week we're going to start, uh, most likely we'll start with uh, Sarita Bowen. We'll start telling her story. Um, it's another interesting story, um, but, you know, not nearly as involved and, and uh, big, I guess, as Sherry's. So um, we will end it on that note. Um, I just want to do it. Does anybody on the panel have anything they would like to uh, add or say before we take off? Jack? Well, well, it's not it's not host law case related, but um, okay, that's if, fine. <laughs> if, well, uh, as many out there know that are following the Avery Dassey cases, the state has responded today um, about the uh, Azelna's request to remand the case back to the circuit court to consider her motion for her second post-conviction scientific testing. So um, if Susan, maybe some, I don't know how long this thing is. I haven't even, I just looked at it a little bit, but I didn't look at the page count. Uh, we're, we're probably going to go live on an open mic here in a few minutes and read that out. And that's pretty much all I've got to add at this point. Just um, for those that are interested. It's just eight pages, Jeff. Okay, so it won't take long at all. Well, we can discuss it, but yeah. I mean, I know there's exhibits attached to it that are separate. We're not going to read those out because those are all prior motions and so forth and so on. We're not going to read those. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jack. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Strover, very much. Um, and uh, welcome back anytime. And uh, thank you to everybody in the chat uh, for hanging out tonight with us, listening and asking questions. We appreciate it um, every time. So um, Kay, Susan, Cherie, any comments before we go? No, not for me. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, with that said, we'll see you guys, everybody here again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Central. And until then, Peace out.